Hello, everyone. Uh, it is such a pleasure to welcome you here um, on this hot, relatively warm day, and also to welcome two of my favorite people, extraordinary artists and Berkeley alums who have inspired so many of us for um, many years and in various regions of the world. Um, <clears throat> Bruce and Stan are both artists that uh, lots of Lots of people and lots of organizations like to claim. Uh, curators like to claim them, producers like to claim them, uh, museums, theaters, biennials, uh, and uh, we at UC Berkeley like to claim them too. They are, uh, one of them moved here in the early 60s from Dartmouth uh, to join UC Berkeley's art department when he realized he could no longer refuse the call of sculpture. And another one of them came later as a graduate student in order to uh, learn more deeply about the history and techniques of theater making in the United States. Uh, and since then, since then, and since their Berkeley careers, they have left and uh, largely transformed in many ways the different art landscapes in which they work. Many of you know that Bruce Beasley's early career was quite, quite precocious beginning before he even graduated here, he, uh, the Treehouse was selected for inclusion in MoMA's 1961 exhibition, The Art of Assemblage, which uh, a, a, a very famous exhibition that is taught routinely in 20th century art history courses. MoMA acquired Chorus soon after, making him the youngest artist ever to be represented in their collection. He enjoyed his first solo gallery exhibition also at that time, and that same year, still a student, barely, you know, out of here, he not only appeared in the Paris Biennial, but won the Purchase Prize from the French Minister of Culture. So precocious uh, starts like that don't always yield uh, long-term careers, but in this case, uh, we have an exceptional situation. Bruce, Lee, Bruce Beasley has managed to expand and sustain a career of continued curiosity and innovation for over 55 years. He extended abstract expressionist principles and practices of assemblage into what is truly his own vocabulary. That quest for form and feeling prompted him to fashion new fabrication processes in order to fabricate new forms. That also happened to mean collaborating with scientists and engineers in order to develop new processes of industrial construction. Beasley's practice is one where art and science meet and transform each other. Beasley was not content to confine himself to certain materials, even materials whose arrangement had earned him so much acclaim, and he pushed himself to more uh, thinking, began to give himself new parameters, working with steel, wood, granite, bronze casts, and his processes have expanded even more recently, including now 3D printing. The list of museums, private collections, and cities that own or have commissioned works by Beasley is so long, I won't recount them all, but they include prestigious sites such as LA County, MFA Houston, MoMA New York, SF MoMA, the National Museum of Art in Washington, D.C., the Guggenheim, uh, uh, and more, most recently, Beasley has given a major bequest of his works and his studios to our beloved neighbor, the Oakland Museum of California. And now also, Beasley's works, as many of you know, excer uh, pieces from the Rondo series can be found on the grounds of our own campus. One of them will stay permanently, floating before the entry of Hearst Planning Building. Stan Lai, Lai Sheng Shuang, has been heralded by the international press as the best Chinese language playwright and director in the world. The New York Times called Secret, um, one of his plays, Secret Love in Peach Blossom Land, the most popular contemporary play in China. And I'm very pleased that Stan will begin rehearsals, I think, tomorrow for another state American staging of that play at the Ashland Theater Festival. Stan is really the author of some 35 plays and a best-selling book on creativity, our theme for today. And he's received Taiwan's National Arts Award an unprecedented two times. Also, he was inducted by President Ma into the Chinese Theater Hall of Fame in 2011. He was a professor at Taipei National University of the Arts, where he was founding dean of the College of Theater 
and has in that role and subsequently had a profound influence on the majority uh, on a majority of theater professionals who work in Taiwan and beyond today. As co-founders of the performance workshop, Stan and his spouse Nai Chu Ding are rightly credited with revolutionizing theatrical practice in East Asia, turning the theater space into an intercultural laboratory that joins Euro-American and East Asian performance traditions. His famous crosstalk plays have not only been produced worldwide, but continue to serve as springboards for developing the expressive and collaborative skills of emerging theater artists today. His play, The Village, embodies the fragile intimacies and fraught politics of cross-strait <coughs> relationships in Taiwan and China, and has been called the pinnacle of our era of theater by Beijing News. And I'm proud to say that his epic eight-hour masterpiece, A Dream Like a Dream, began when he served as an artist in residence here at UC Berkeley in 2000, and now inspires pilgrimages, really, from world citizens who are compelled to see it. It should be said that Lai's artistry goes beyond theater as well. He's written and directed widely acclaimed feature films, including The Peach Blossom Land and The Red Lotus Society. Uh, his improv improvisational experiment in television, All in the Family Are Humans, was a huge hit in, on Taiwan TV and ran for 600 episodes. He's also directed innovative versions of Western classics, including An Evening of Samuel Beckett or Mozart's Cozy Fantuti at the Shanghai Opium Den, uh, a Chinese um, language world premiere of Tony Kushner's Angels in America, which he also translated. In 2009, Lai created the acclaimed opening and closing ceremonies for the International Death Olympics, Olympic Games in Taipei. And, his, and he's recently created a new rock opera for the centennial celebration of the Republic of China in, in October 2011. So he's not afraid of spectacle. Um, and I think I can say you've been commissioned, commissioned to make a new uh, musical based on the intercultural, can I say that? <laughs> the intercultural influence and the personal story of Bruce Lee. And we'll hear about more projects as well. Stan and Bruce, we are so thrilled to have you here, that the stars align to have you both in the same room at the same time. I feel like the creativity question is going to blow the roof off of the alumni house. Uh, okay, but, but having um, trust in its structural integrity, I hope you can join me in giving these two the warmest, warmest of welcomes. Ended questions just to get the ball rolling, and uh, we'll hear from both of them and let them talk to each other uh, around some questions about art making, about creativity, about what it is to be um, have the kind of careers that they do now, uh, and uh, then we'll open it up for questions. Okay, so keep them um, keep them at the ready. So first of all, um, Bruce and Stan, I think. In, a lot of times when people even um, begin to imagine an, an artistic process, they're wondering how you even begin. Um, what, how do you allow yourself to begin? How do you know that a new work is in formation? Um, what are those first moments? What inspires you to begin? And have you ever been afraid, afraid to start a new project? Well, um, I'm not... I'm not an artist who sees finished works in my head ahead of time. And for a long time, I felt that that meant I was inadequate and, and didn't really have it because there's all this romance about Michelangelo looking at the block and seeing the figure in it and all of that. And um, I never did that. Um, and I felt quite inadequate about that. Um, what I learned for myself is that the, the sculptures come out of a process of discovery of shape. Uh, I'm fundamentally interested in shape itself and believe that shape is a human emotional language. Uh, the geometry is the intellectual language of shape and sculpture is the emotional language of shape. But, uh, but I don't see finished pieces and so I had to develop for myself a process 
that would allow me to discover compositions that then speak to me. So I don't feel that I create the sculptures as much as I feel I discover them. Um, and in a way, that helps that, that the process of beginning, because if you give up the idea that you're starting something that is going to a final completion of creating a work of art, and it, and it doesn't end up in that, then, then that's a failure. If you look at it as a endlessly interesting process of engaging, of in just searching for responses in shapes, then it's an endless process that's always interesting. Um, and sometimes something comes out that you might exhibit, many times not, but there's no, there's no failure in that case, and therefore no inhibition of starting. Uh, I, I tend to sometimes think that the whole process is a disease <laughs> because it's ongoing all the time and it's something that I guess people like us can't shake away from. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. it's, it's a disease. It's uh, the, the, the urge to be creative. You can call it a virtue, but to me, you know, sometimes it just gnaws at you. So anything you do, everything you see, uh, it's all going into this constant process of seeing what, how you're going to make that into some sort of a, a production, sort of a play or, or, or whatever. Um, I agree with Bruce very much that theater, for me, is the process of discovery. Although I have envisioned whole, whole works in an instant, uh, but that came later. I think at the beginning, I think what Bruce was saying about process, uh, I find that to be I thought immediately this is very Berkeley, you know, or, or I don't know, maybe it was part of the 60s or that, that whole push that I, I believe deeply in, that the process is certainly more important than the final product. But in the end, we all have to deliver a final product. Um, I think in Bruce's case, it's more final. In our case, it's like we, we, have, we announce a play, the tickets are sold, often they're sold out, and still haven't written the play. Um, and then we perform it because people have bought tickets to it and then we keep refining it and keep working on it. So always I think the, the whole idea of discovering a work is uh, in, in, incredibly precious and always interesting uh, because you start with something and then you don't doubt why you started because it keeps revealing itself. And what is it revealing? It is revealing what you really care about. It's, it's, it, there's some concern in this disease that you have, that the things you see in your life, uh, or in the news, or in your family, or whatever, just or even in this room, it becomes something that you are compelled to start to work on, to write on. And, you, and often you don't know why. And then the whole process is a process of discovering not only the piece, but also the why. And yeah. once you know about the why, then the piece usually reveals itself. Can either of you say, I, I don't want to put you too much on the spot, but any, can you recall any kind of moments where you had that sort of aha moment, that you were in process, and then something kind of gelled, and you were like, wait, this might be it. Oh, yes, I mean, you, 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 that has to happen. I mean, so, if, so if, one if of your that doesn't happen, yeah. then... <laughs> so one of your works, uh, uh, one, one of the works that, any, any particular, a, a play or a sculpture where, was there something about a, about how negative space appeared to you, about how something was atop something else, or... Well, you see, I'm just constantly... I basically, I make a whole lot of little, what I call what ifs. What if I put this shape? What if I put that shape? And most of the response is, so what? But then a little thing happens. And it's like, I call it a heartbeat. It's like a little invitation. It's though I was wandering around in this maze and a little, there's a little finger down this hall that says, come this way. Um, and then, then what I feel my job is, is to follow that little hint that invitation. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it peters out, and other times it, it leads to, to, to something. But there's a point where, if, if it leads to something, there's a point where that heartbeat turns into something that's, uh, that I feel is it's like it's alive. Mm -hmm. um, 
and that that's the closest to that really exciting that moment the, the that, that aha that that it's it's like now there's it's the sculpture those shapes now have a life of their own um, and then the most interesting part is that that how many of those can be taken out and still have it be alive because most likely I put in too much um, and so then the most interesting part is to take out, them out and see uh, it's amazing I'll take a piece out oh it's still alive it's a little bit better it's a little bit cleaner it's a little bit better. and then I'll take one piece out and it's just like it goes dead and it's wonderful because that one of course goes back in and then that's when I know it's finished yeah I, I think um, for, for one instance of my play that started in Berkeley called A Dream Like a Dream, which turned out to be an eight-hour play, uh, there was a, it started actually two months before I came to Berkeley when I was in India. And I was sitting uh, at the Bodhgaya Stupa where uh, Sakyamuni Buddha was enlightened 2,500 years ago. And suddenly, one evening, all these different sort of threads that I've been thinking about for maybe 10 years that, that didn't necessarily have anything to do with each other. Let's say 10 storylines that had nothing to do with each other suddenly made sense that they should all come together. And it was these 10 and not those 10. It was just things that suddenly, bang, came together. It's like 10 different people assembling in one room. And it all made sense to me. And I knew in that moment that I had a very long play. Rather than ten little plays, you right. had one big long play. Right. And I, and I went the next day to write it out, and I just sat there in front of the stupa, uh, where, at a, at a Buddhist sacred place, all of the people are circumambulating around the, the stupa in, in, the, in a clockwise direction. And so I would just be sitting there and watching this river of this stream of people uh, and then people leaving and people coming back, people I knew, people I didn't know. And that gave me the, the organic impetus to, to say, uh, to, uh, to, to think, well, why do people circ circumambulate the sacred object? And, and, and that is because they want to keep the, the, the holy object in the center. And so I thought as a theater uh, person, the holy object actually should be our audience. So that's why I thought of putting the audience in the center yeah. and then have our play move around the audience in a clockwise uh, fashion. I think we have that image. Oh, okay. we, could, we, could, um, yeah. we could show it. So, sure. so it really also that the, so that the, so that you thought you had several plays, you had several storylines going, and you then also in the same. And you can find the, one of the whole, you can keep going, oh, and see if you can find one. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. Anyway, that's okay. We'll... It's kind of, it's, we, we're alternating Beasley okay. and Lai here. <laughs> Only here. This okay, is the first that's all right. That's okay. But uh, probably, you know, you can imagine if, if an audience, we did this in room seven, uh, the audience in the middle and the, the play revolving around the audience. Mm -hmm. And this, um, this leads me to think that um, what, what Bruce was saying also, uh, about putting things in, taking things out. Um, actually, in that process, I didn't, I just wrote it and it was pretty much, that was it. You know, maybe if we're talking about the ratio of used used stuff to unused stuff, it was maybe 1, one to 1.1. 1. 1, you know, so basically everything I wrote was kept stayed into the, yeah. So, um, I think, there are rare moments like that when, when a piece just materializes in, in one's mind. Uh, and when it does, it's a funny combination of, maybe academically we, we can use the terms form and content, uh, but actually in, in the mind at the moment, it's one thing. It's not, it's not two things, you know? It's not like, oh, I'm thinking of a theme and I'm thinking of a body for that theme or a way that that theme can be expressed theatrically. Uh, it's, it, it's, it tends to happen at the same time. And I, and I find that is the mysterious part of it, because our work, I'm sure Bruce is the same, it's, there's an emotional aspect to it, there's a theoretical aspect to it, and then there's a craftsmanship aspect to it. 
And of course, we, we must be at a certain level of craftsmanship in order to, to execute the things that we think of. Otherwise, there's no way we can do that. But then, how does it all come together? Uh, I think, uh, for us, we've been working long enough to know that it just sort of happens, you know. But um, I think this is a process that many younger artists would be interested in, in knowing how to do better. Yeah. yeah. You know, Stan brought up something that I think is, I've always thought, although in my field, painting and sculpture are usually put in the same bag and we, there's exhibitions of painting and sculpture and curators of painting and sculpture, I really often felt that theater was much more related to, to sculpture uh, than painting because your, your art takes place in, in the same physical space as the audience, as does sculpture. And that's profoundly different from painting. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's one of the magics of, of both of our fields and also one of the problems because being in the real space that you are all in, we have all those real problems of gravity and heat and, and real space. Um, it's not imaginary space. But I think that that's also part of the, of the magic of it. Um, and I think one of the things that's interested me in your work is that your, your use of space um, uh, in, a, in a more imaginative way. Um, I always saw the proscenium stage as kind of like a picture frame. Right. And it, in a way, it's, uh, it's, it makes it safer, uh, more distant, um, and, and getting the, the, the play out into the audience um, is makes it a little <coughs> scarier, but way more presence and and um, uh, and, and authority uh, because we then the audience were not safely in that screen and then there's the you know the real space is there where the stage ends and then it's kind of magical space. So you're entering into the that your play is with the, the, the real existent same space as the audience, as we are with sculpture. And I think that gives us a lot more in common, I, I feel, than, than with painters, to be honest with you. Certainly. Um, what is the name of the filmmaker Tarkovsky's book? Sculpting in Time. Mm -hmm. But that's what we do, too. In the theater, it's the same thing. The time probably is our most important uh, tool. And, and that's, or medium, actually. It's a medium that we sculpt because as a director and as a playwright, um, I, I must say, I must use the very uh, uh, unpopular word manipulate, but we do manipulate time, the time that we are using so that you, the audience, will feel what we want you to feel at any given moment. I think that is our craft. Uh, so uh, when it comes to talking about um, theater as sculpture, Certainly, the proscenium stage is, is more than just a picture frame. It's sort of like a shopping window, wind, like in a department store window, right. which I think that's what Bruce is saying, the safety of it. Um, you feel safe in just being a spectator and not involved in it. But once we break that window, break that frame, um, many, many magical things happen. Uh, I also recently did a piece called uh, Dream Walk, in the town of Wuzhen in, uh, in China at the Wuzhen Theater Festival where I used a, a cluster of old buildings. Uh, and then the audience would be um, moving through these houses, uh, seeing, seeing a play, uh, but they, they're not in a set space. They're, they're moving, uh, they're led by tour guides, basically, into the next space, the next space, the next space, and keep seeing the scenes unfold. And to me, although I don't think of the word sculpture, when, I, when I'm doing it, of course, this is certainly something, this sculpting, sculpting something in time. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, I wanted to, we've started to think about relationships across these art fields. You brought up something when, when you said that, um, that for, for Bruce it might be a little different when it comes to sculpture, <coughs> that, you, that you have to finish, um, that the, the terms of finishing maybe are, are different that the sculpture gets put in a box and sent elsewhere, or there's the, um, the, the, the pressure of people having bought tickets, that, that that tells you when a work is finished, and it just has to be, <laughs> that it has to be, that it's done. Um, I wonder how you know when a work is finished, or whether you, 
whether you send it out even when you don't really feel that it's finished, or um, whether you've ever been in a situation where you've been afraid to send something out. Um, um, how, how you know when to stop this process that is so compelling? Sometimes it's very clear that we're done. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes it's not. And it varies from project to project. And for some, one, I recall one project I did called Strange Tales of Taiwan, which is a one person monologue with a very uh, uh, wonderful actor named Billy Beecher that I worked with, with him. And on opening night, we looked at each other and said, we're not there. You know? and, and people were on our back to put out a, re a recording of it because previous works I'd done with him had become audio recordings that the first one we did sold a million copies in Taiwan. Uh, and so the, 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 the businessmen are all out saying, yeah, we're, we're ready with our recording material, can we come? And we said, no, we're not, this show is not ready. Uh, it was a two-hour, one-person monologue. And it took us about 20 performances to get it right. But we only had like 25 performances. <laughs> you know, yeah. But we did get it right. But it's 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 something that um, nags you when it's not when it's not right. And I don't know if Bruce ever has an experience like that because for us we do, you know it's in a set place and time and it's kind of like an exam you know and the the bell rings and you have to hand in your exam and if you're not done actually you still have tomorrow to fix it you know but in the theater. So um, I've had many experiences like that, and, and to me, often the greatest chances to redo a piece, you know, like a few years later when uh, we're uh, doing a revival, like I'm going to Ashland to do a Secret Love in Peach Blossom Land. Again, it's a time to re-examine everything you're doing. You plan to? Yes. Uh, uh, lots of rewriting that I've done. Uh, okay, yeah. really. So I'll have to go up. Yeah. But, <laughs> but uh, Bruce, do you? Yeah, How can well, you rewrite a sculpture? <laughs> well, I mean, we do have deadlines for exhibitions. Um, and, but one of the interesting things that I learned very early was that, um, that the first really, one of the first really important artists that I knew personally and that I actually worked for was Peter Wilkins, who was here at Berkeley. And he was a sort of a volcanic kind of, of personality and in many ways a movie star version of what it what an artist would do. <laughs> he was dramatic and, and charismatic, and, and he he worked in a kind of almost volcanic, explosive kind of way. He went through periods of not doing much, and was very much dr driven by deadlines. Um, put things off, but then he would have this e explosive uh, output. Um, sometimes just days before the show was to open, or or weeks, and it would be this flurry of activity and and sort of creative explosion, and I worked for him doing, doing those, and one of the things that I learned is that I'm not that way at all. Um, I, I don't like to create or make sculpture or discover sculpture under pressure. Uh, that, uh, that I, I tighten up, I get worried, um, uh, I don't make good decisions, I'm not happy about it, uh, so I just don't do it. And for me, um, I want the work to be done weeks if not months ahead of time and then I'll decide if you aren't going to be in the show. But I, I'm not I'm not good at, at working under pressure, but some people are and I think that's one of the some things that's, that, that's important for young artists to figure out for themselves. My path is my path and your path is yours. They have to find their own path. Mm -hmm. But um, your own rhythm of working, whether you, you need pressure, whether that's helpful, or not is a very, very individual um, aspect. Um, I don't like it, and, and I, I, I freeze up, mm -hmm. but others, others thrive under it. Mm -hmm. Well, that, you're thinking about what conditions make you freeze and what conditions make you thrive, I wonder if we can talk about this word that we're using to title this gathering, creativity. What is it that sparks creativity? What is creativity even in the first place? It's a word that, especially here in the Bay Area, we hear a lot. It's very ubiquitous. Um, a lot of people are, work as creatives in various industries. And I wonder about how you both hear this term, creativity. Is it something that we associate with artists, per se, or something that anyone can have? Um, is it? 
curiosity or success or risk taking? I mean, what are its associations for you? Well, I think it's related to, to talent, which is another very painful That's a way term. painful term, right. Um, the, um, in, in a way, uh, I think it, creativity is related to curiosity, at least I've always felt that way. But it, it, it has to be directed. And I, I think that the people that end up as professional artists in any field are people who had, um, I, I think ideas come out of curiosity in the first place. Um, and then, but you, I think that talent is no more than having an affinity for something. Um, uh, I love music, but I have no affinity for it. I'm the receiver of that. Um, but I have no, no, no skill in it, no affinity. And I think that what happens is that if there's a certain personality type that is curious, has ideas, but I have ideas about shape. And <coughs> most people don't have ideas about shape. <laughs> and and I, I, the, you know, you, dancers and choreographers have ideas about human movement. They think about it, it comes to them, it's, it's, it's a natural affinity. Um, poets have ideas about words. Um, but so I think what happens is you, you need to be start off with curiosity and having ideas, but if you don't have an affinity for that to go to, then it really isn't going to develop into something really serious. I think creativity is uh, a basic truth of, of the universe, and it's happening every moment spontaneously all around us. Uh, I think the energy of creativity is something that we all own, we all have, but we've, most people have sort of blocked it, uh, and it gets blocked at an early age uh, by so many things, by, by family, by social uh, norms and everything. And so we have to sort of relearn how to be creative, to relearn how to be like these trees in this beautiful twilight out there. Um, they're, they're doing things that uh, are, are extremely creative at the moment, to me. So, um, actually, as, as you said, Shannon, I wrote this book about creativity um, in, in Chinese. And one of the basic precepts of the book was that, actually, there are just two basic precepts of the book. The first one is that we are all born with creativity, but we have blocked it. This is something I've said. So how to unlock it is to relearn how we see the world and to see how all of the habits that we've accumulated through our lives have actually, are they are actually habits that block creativity. And how can we recreate our habits so that our habits habitually help us be creative. The second important concept to me is that the way we teach or learn creativity has been handicapped uh, throughout the world. Because I've taught for, I taught for many years, I'm sure Bruce teaches a lot of people, Shannon, you teach. Um, in Buddhism, there is a term that if you want to do Buddhist practice well, you have to have two, two skills. I'm sorry, two things. One is called wisdom, and one is called method. So, so you have to have the wisdom or if you're, let's say, you're a Buddhist monk and you're, you're, you're chanting your mantras uh, and you have no idea what they mean, then you have method but you don't have any wisdom. And then you have some people who are always talking about the, Buddhist, the, the Buddha nature, emptiness, blah, 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 but they don't have any practice. They don't sit on their, they don't do any meditation. Then these are people with wisdom and without method. And this goes for any, you know, if you're a businessman, you're a professor, it's, it's the same for everything. So, for a creative person, what we do as a teacher, we normally just teach method. So what happens to the wisdom aspect of that? I find it's very intriguing in, in the modern world. Uh, when I was writing my book, I, I uh, went to the dictionaries to figure out what, what wisdom was. And the Webster's told me wisdom is the quality of being wise. Very helpful. <laughs> I gave him one more chance. I went to wise. And, and wise said, characterized by wisdom. <laughs> okay, so, so I think there I found 
hey, we have a problem. Yeah. You know, we have a problem in that no one, either either no one knows or no one is willing to define this thing in our modern society today. And if it's half of what creativity is, then that means that we're, we're, we're not getting half of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, the, and the problem is, in schools, in training programs, we're all teaching method. How can we learn wisdom? And probably to me, that should be in a different domain that we learn it. And that domain is the domain of our life instead of our learning. So, basically. What you're saying reminds me of, um, we, we have a relatively new chancellor here who, who has a, a large focus on a number of initiatives, including the arts, uh, and also on transforming the undergraduate experience. And it's really, I think, an interesting uh, task that we have to give ourselves for thinking about what undergraduate education is in the 21st century. And one of the things that he said he, he felt you could say definitively is that whatever world they're entering, it will change again very soon. <laughs> and that it will be about trying to equip citizens of the world with the dispositions that can address that and be open to it and worldly before it. And I would see that as, as saying, like, if you have a center and then a periphery, everything we teach in universities, well, not everything, most things are, are on the periphery. Uh -huh. And so how do we teach the center? Yeah. Or who is to define that center? And, it's, and is it dangerous to define that center? Mm -hmm. Right, right, yeah. If you worry about if you define it, you, you will instrumentalize it in a way. But look at, let's say, if you're a disciple of Socrates uh, thousands of years ago, uh, what, what are you learning from him? You know, I mean, if these guys were around today, they'd probably do a workshop at Berkeley, you know, for a weekend, <laughs> get a certificate from them. And stuff. But those disciples in the day were learning from the only course he offered, and that course we could probably call wisdom. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. we don't have a department of wisdom. We don't have a course yeah. in wisdom. You know? In fact, probably anyone who wanted to teach wisdom 101 you know, maybe would be in trouble because you probably sort of create a cult or something with you know, ideas. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> no, I think it is. It's very, very hard to um, figure out how to stay true to these um, qualities that are intangible and so necessary. But you see the problem if you're teaching on the periphery, then the center gets neglected, and then, absolutely. and then that's what everyone is learning. Yeah, absolutely. Well. Uh, I wonder if we can talk just a little bit more then about, um, you know, you could say that these are two artists who come with different methods to the extent that you are supposedly known for your prowess in two different forms, sculpture and theater. But you started to talk also about how there is more kinship than across, across these forms. And I'm wondering if we can just press on that just a little bit more. Um, uh, Stan was talking about time, about sculpting in time, being a key element of your practice. Is there any way you think about sculpting time, or is that is time well, actually, not a thing for you? Actually, unless you do sculpture that moves, time is one of the aspects that we don't have. That you say you don't have, right. Um, and actually, um, I'm, I'm happy to not have that. I, 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 I'm dealing with enough. I, I, maybe I'm just not deep enough to uh, take that one on. Um, but I think you're saying something important. I, I, I feel that I actually learn more from other art forms than I do from my own. Um, and I think part of that is that um, there's, if, if I respond to something in dance or theater or poetry or music, um, I'm, I really responded to that and I don't have the, the knowledge and the professionalism that I bring to looking at sculpture. And it's very hard to be a, a, a true audience in your own field. I mean, you, we, we like to think we can, but it's hard. But for instance, I, I have set out to try to make shapes that would achieve an effect that I've received from another art form. Um, I haven't always succeeded. I mean, one that comes to mind is um, that beautiful passage in the reflect, re, uh, meditation by uh, Massonnier, the, the, the French composer, which I think is maybe the most beautiful piece of music in the world. And I've said to myself, can I make a shape that has that, the eloquence, 
that absolute sense of perfection um, and, and, and soaring beauty. Um, I haven't succeeded in it, but in a way that's to me more, um, uh, more, more, in, in, more inspiring than looking at a sculpture that, that I admire very much because in a way I know it too much. Mm -hmm. So I find that, that just in learning, uh, and even learning things, the transitions, um, uh, I think are very important in all, all art forms, but I can sometimes see a transition in literature or in a play or something and say, ah, oh, now that really worked. Mm -hmm. And how can I learn from that? Because I, I felt the essence of that because I'm in a way freer in responding, so it's not a it's not a technique. I'm not going to learn how that sculpture sculptor did that. I want to learn the essence of that that transition. So anyway, yeah, I agree, Bruce. I, I think I I get most of my inspiration from outside of the theater these days. Yeah, um, I think maybe it's because we've just been doing it for so long uh, that we don't and we're very confident in our own craft that uh, we don't think we need to learn any more craft. I mean, I mean that may sound arrogant. It's probably yeah. true. Yeah. Uh, but I recall the, uh, my, my uh, good friend, the, the uh, filmmaker, Ho, Ho Xiaoxian, from Taiwan, uh, he once told me, just a private conversation, he said, you know, I think I can do anything. I can film, I can make anything. You know, and that was when Jurassic Jurassic Park came out. I said, you can make Jurassic Park. He said, I could do that with my hands tied behind my back. <laughs> and then he said, now the question is, what do I want to make? Yeah. And I think this was very profound, that he could tell me that he felt that he was at a craft level, that he could do anything. But then what do you do? Yeah. And to me, that is also an example of method and wisdom, uh, and how those two things can, can possibly work together. Um, for me, I recall when I was a grad student here, uh, living, we lived on uh, Smythe Fernwald, and uh, while, when I was doing the laundry um, uh, with my young daughter, and then always I met this guy who was in the physics department, and, and he, was, he would always talk to me about quantum physics. Um, while we were doing the laundry, and our daughters were playing together. Yeah. And I, it was so inspiring just to, to, to hear what people were saying on a deep level about, about anything. You know? And I, I find that true. I like, talk to you know, businessmen who are very, very good at what they do, um, other artists, uh, um, all sorts of people. Who, whoever is good at what they do, you know, I think I can learn something from them, but not necessarily theater people. It's, it's, it's funny. Of course, um, I get to meet a lot of wonderful, great artists in the theater, and then through talking, we, we, we learn a lot from each other, but uh, not so much from seeing the work. Interesting. Yeah. A big part of what we're trying to do, both at the Arts Research Center and in this campus initiative, is, is enable cross-art conversation. And we have a lot of different reasons why we're trying to promote that, but I, I just want to flag that we have another reason. That, it, that this notion that artists actually can be more, uh, more inspired by an encounter with something outside of their art form. Um, I think that that's something that the musician who's pursuing music and the actor who's pursuing theater and the sculptor who's, who's hanging out in the visual art department, I think we, they all need to hear that. Well, sure, because we tend to, if it's in our own lang the language of our own work, we, we tend to to copy what we've seen at work. You see, you, you're not seeing the essence of it when it's in your own, the, your own craft, your own vocabulary. So when it's something outside of that, um, issues of you know, presence, completion, resolution, um, you, you see that, I see that in another sculptor's work, and I see it how, how they did that. But it's not. But when I feel that in, in another art form, I'm going more to the what's the essence of it. Right. Yeah. You're not preoccupied with the technique. Yeah. Or the method. And and going back to what you were saying about um, time, mm -hmm. I think because the, in the theater we tell stories, and stories take time. And stories take place in time. I think sculpture to me is more of a presence. The word you just used. You know, it's, it's a presence and permanence and permanence. And permanence. And through that, we, we certainly can learn, because as we craft a story, 
we are actually sculpting a structure. Mm -hmm. And the structure is what really makes the story talk to people. So I, of, I do often feel like I'm a sculptor. And I have used that word when I talk to people about how, you, how I really <coughs> build, build my place. And yeah. associated with narrative and story. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing that I, al that I also hoped you might talk about, at least just a bit, is, your, is the fact that both of you are internationally renowned artists, which is to say that your work appears in a number of different contexts, different regions of the world, um, uh, uh, different pe people speaking different languages and of different cultures in are encountering it. And whether you have noticed that you adjust your work in relationship to certain um, national cultures or regional cultures, whether there's different kinds of responses that are unexpected or different as you move to different places, um, different professional norms in different places, just what it is to be thinking transnationally when you're an international well, artist. I'm, I'm going to be working at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival and I'm learning so much about Unions. Oh, <laughs> oh these strange. Oh, uh, rehearsals have strange to, provincial practices. Yeah, you have to break every fifty-five minutes. You have to break for five minutes. You so know, professional and, norms, right there. Uh, are different. You can't add rehearsals here and there. Blah 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 blah. It's I don't know. It's a little. It's a little stifling. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it is different. It's different than, than the than the theaters in China. Sure, we don't have unions. Taiwan. <laughs> 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 yeah. Right. It's, uh, well, no, but I have to respect that. Mm -hmm. and, and I realize that it also helps. But uh, in a funny way, the play I'm doing, Secret Love in Peach Blossom Land, is about two theater groups who are mistakenly booked into the same theater. <laughs> and that doesn't happen at the, Ash at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's too organized. It's too organized. They, they run it like a Swiss, a Swiss clock, you know. So, so I have to figure out how to make that believable. The fact that they have somehow screwed up, you know, uh, and sort of make it make it interesting to them too. <laughs> well, I, I I think for me, um, first of all, I I'm very much a part and come out of um, modernism that that came out of, of late 19th century in in, in Europe. A modernism in not in entirely cultural, but in but in fine arts and mm -hmm. visual arts. So of an issue that the aesthetics is a language itself. It stripped of context and, and politics and storyline, contrary to classic art that was linked, or the aesthetics were linked to social agreed stories. And I believe in that deeply. And I think that I probably wouldn't be an artist with, with, without that, because that, but that's still a battle in the West and it's, to be honest with you, I found it more of a battle in, in the East. Um, I have, it's harder uh, in a country, I show quite a bit in China, and um, there, there is more uh, distance, but more resistance to the idea that there is no, no verbalizable story behind the imagery. Um, and I understand that 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 is a, a cultural issue. It's it's still diff difficult in our in our own country. It, the analogy I try to use with people is that abstract art is like, is like music. Happy music isn't because it sounds like people laughing, and music that makes it sad isn't because it sounds like people crying. The the music itself, that arrangement of notes, carries deep, complicated human reactions and feelings, and. That is what abstraction does for me, that the shapes alone are a, a com emotional communication. But that is a, a, a difficult concept for cultures where the art has always been linked to cultural stories. Um, and, and in a way, it's kind of like going back to the 19th century and, and trying to, to argue the, the, the validity for, for non-narrative painting uh, and, and, and sculpture. Um, but I had a fun experience in, in, in China. I have a large piece that was done um, for, the, for the Olympics, and it stayed there in the park. And I, I just happened to be there the first day the park was open to the public. The, the, that big Olympic park was very restricted from 
Um, but, and I was being filmed by a Chinese film crew, and so therefore there was a translator. And it was the first day it was open. And the, t the title of my sculpture was Gathering of the Moons, plural. And um, people would read that and then kind of look around. And, um, Where's you know, the moon? But how can there be? And, and uh, several people came and then through the translator asked me, well, could I explain the, the, the title? Because um, there really there was only one moon. Um, and I had purposely given that a little bit of a provocative title. But I would say, like, well, um, what about the lover's moon, the new moon, the full moon, the, the waxing moon, the waning moon? Um, oh, awesome. Uh, but, but, but nevertheless, abstraction remains still, it's a battle even in the, in the West, and it's more of the legitimacy of abstraction as a valid expression itself not associated with, with any storyline is, is more of, more of a, a, a battle in, in Asia. Not only is it people expect some narrative or storyline to be associated with a scul sculpture, they also expect some sort of message. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you say there's, there isn't any, they won't believe you. you know? <laughs> so you constantly act, asked, what does this mean? Or, or then it doesn't have any value. If it has no message, then it's without value. Mm -hmm. right. right. And I think certainly this is, this is something cultural that it'll take, it takes time. It takes time. Yeah. Stan, could you, as, a, as someone who is a uh, Taiwanese citizen who works uh, a great deal in China, can you talk about, uh, for the group, a little bit about what that has meant um, for you to be um, navigating some of these historic <laughs> uh, pretty historic I've, uh, big conversation. I've been doing theater for 30 years and probably half of that time I've been working in China, mm -hmm. maybe more. Uh, and I find people, the first time they see my work, they, it takes them maybe half an hour to, to get into what, what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. I would call it the rules of the game because I think any director, when you present a work, you're also trying to teach the audience how to look at, how to, how to receive your work. Uh, and so that's built into the way the, the play is performed. And it, it takes them 20 minutes, 30 minutes to, to understand that. And then they get into it. And then there's not much difference. I think uh, when, today when, when a play of mine is performed in Taipei or in Shanghai, if, you're, if I'm sitting backstage, sometimes I don't quite know where I am because it could be either. The way the audience is responding is basically the same. And to them, I think to answer your question and, and to tie in with what Bruce was saying, um, when we did The Village in Beijing, uh, which is, The Village is a, is a three-hour play about uh, these military villages that were temporarily built in Taiwan in 1949 when the nationalists retreated to Taiwan after the communists took over China, and then people lived there for decades. Uh, people, theater people came backstage to me and they said, how did you do that? You know, and I said, how did I do what? And then the question came, which I thought was an extremely intelligent question, which is, how did you remove yourself from it? And to me, that was that is the right question. Uh, I think artists in China, they're taught not to remove themselves from the work. Um, I guess I have my roots right here in Berkeley. And, and I think my teachers taught me that you should remove yourself from your work. If you, if you want to present something, if you want to make something beautiful, you can't be there. You know, you have to find it. In order to I found have a formal, a formal uh, distance, uh, distance or whatever. From the work. But I found it very difficult to, to answer them and to tell them how to do it because yeah. it's, it's, it's not only a question of technique, it's a question of, of your whole concept of what art is. Uh, well, I want to open it up for questions just as a last, um, uh, one last question from me before we do. I wonder if you uh, have uh, any last words of, we'll say, sort of wisdom that you would share with us at UC Berkeley as we're thinking about um, educating the next generation. <laughs> uh, both those who want to be artists and those um, 
for whom the arts might be a lifelong, a lifelong love, um, something that might be in their lives forever. Um, how do you have any thoughts about how we should be thinking about educating um, or sensitizing this next group of world citizens? Well, boy, I, 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 to be honest with you, I think the university is two roles, and they're, they're difficult to mix, and I do sympathize with that. The, the professional training track is, is different from the, the broadening of, of the soul of the, the, to expose education to many things. And those are really, in my opinion, sort of different, and it's hard to um, uh, it ha maybe hard to mix them, but um, I would actually think we'd be we'd be better off as a society if all students had more exposure to all the arts, uh, and I don't mean just visual arts, right. but some s because they will be forever enriched by that. Um, if 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 you become a lifelong reader, you will never be bored. If if you read poetry or music and, and, and painting and sculpture and dance, all of those are, are so enriching for a, a whole life that for the university to open those doors and give those experiences and the that recognition, and, and the university is so full of teaching of fact and trade and um, intellectualism that that to have that door kept open, I, th I think, as an artist myself, you're, you're better to give us audiences. Um, artists will find themselves, and, and th there will there'll be artists without art schools. Um, but we need audiences, and we need audience with open hearts. Uh, two things come to mind. One, uh, when I was a grad student here, uh, I recall my last year here, the Dramatic Arts brought in a, a Dutch uh, director named Shireen Stroker, who became, I think, my main theater practice mentor. Uh, and she was, uh, she taught me how to build plays through the use of improvisation with my actors. And one day when I <coughs> asked the most stupid question, I mean, I was like her apprentice, I, I asked like, how did you do that? What, what she just did, did in front of me. I said, how? It just blew my mind. I said, how could you have done that? And she said, very matter-of-factly and very seriously, I know, what, I know what you can do on stage, what you can't do. And to me, this was, I think this is maybe the, the sternest message you can give to a young artist. Know what you can do and what you can't do. And if you don't, sorry, you're, you're going to be in trouble. Because this, this is the technique side of it. If you don't know what's going to work, if you're going to think this is going to work, these days I can tell my students they don't like to hear this, but I, I say if they have a certain idea or a certain way they want to do it, and I can already tell it's not going to work, then I can, I can tell them, I say, try this, but I don't think it's ever going to work. <laughs> you know, so you might as well forget it. But they don't like to hear that. You know? But at least to, to know, at least that, you have to get to the stage where you know what works and what doesn't work. The second observation would be considering wisdom, which we just talked about. And I would I don't claim to know what wisdom is, but I, I know that uh, when, I, when I teach my students or when I work with actors or with directors, I think there's a word called motivation, meaning more the reason why you're doing something which is what Director Ho was asking me, what, I, what do I, am I going to do, even though I know how to do everything now? Um, I think this is the key to wisdom, some sort of a key uh, to, to what wisdom is, is in always asking yourself, why are you here? Why, are you, why do you aspire to be an artist? You know, because I think we just give that to people. We, we say, oh, you want to be an artist? Great, great, that's so great. But ne ne not necessarily, you know, because why do you want to be an artist? And, and if you can truthfully answer that, sometimes it's shocking to yourself because you come to face to face with the fact that you want to be an artist because of some very, perhaps, 
crazy or stupid or uh, reasons that that uh, make you a very vain or arrogant person, you know. And and you you must understand that the true artist sort of has to rid himself of all these things. And that to me would be the path toward toward the wisdom we need to be artists. I wonder if there are some questions from the audience. We, I think we have a mic over by Lindsay. Oh. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you very much. Um, I uh, advocate for some of the more vulnerable artistic communities at times um, in Oakland that are maybe creating art but don't have the vehicle to um, put their art out there. And um, as abstract art sometimes has to have um, advocacy to push it forward, what are then some techniques um, advocating for your own work uh, for people to either get it or not get it, but you still get to move it forward and have it be seen. Um, what's worked or not worked? <laughs> you know, to be honest with you, I, I'm, I'm not going to give you any business advice. The, 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 best, the best professional advice I can give you is that if you are making or pursuing any activity that is deeply within you, that it continues to stretch you and you learn new things from and you continue to be excited about, that is a successful artist. And when you sell nothing or, or many things, that's kind of, to me, a secondary aspect. But if, if you're thinking about sales of work when you're making it, to be honest with you, you've just got a job. And the joys, the, it's, it's, it's not a, uh, an art career is not a good business operation. <laughs> and if the joys do not, and rewards do not remain throughout your life, the work that you're making and your relationship with it yourself, then it's a lousy job. And most, most art that's made doesn't sell. And it doesn't mean that it's, it's not good, and the, the paths are very complicated, and, but, but the point I'm trying to make is that that's, that's what not, it's not where the rewards are. At the same time, I, I did want to go back to your point about um, the, the importance of us cultivating people with open hearts. Um, and it seems like the more we can all um, uh, create the, a good kind of contagious love for and openness toward a great deal of work in our communities. We, hopefully we can have a win-win sort of reciprocal, reciprocal situation. Um, so I, I appreciate, appreciate and that. Just to add a line, yeah. um, I, I totally agree with Bruce. And I think when you, I'm not saying you're doing this, but when artists think about selling their work while they're making it, it, it totally pollutes the work, and you can see in the work when, when they do that, that, oh, it's polluted. So, yeah. Um, it's I actually did, it's, it's I didn't tough. mean sales, although yeah. I do like yeah. that point. I guess uh -huh. I didn't um, yeah. formulate the question right. I meant advocating for communities that make art um, as a source of most survival. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And how do they... What, so in terms of people that maybe don't get a piece of work that you're, you do, how do you show it? Whether it gets bought or viewed or how, you know, there's no real word to even explain maybe what I'm asking, but when you're creating something beautiful that no one understands, um, how do you show it? Yeah, or, create a, a, or, or creating some kind of platform that allows for it to be circulated in some way, whether we use the word sh show in that professional sense. Um, well, ideally, you have people, aside from the artists, who know how to do that. <laughs> um, ideally, yeah, because, yeah right. but unfortunately, most of the artists have to fend for themselves, and so they have to really be thinking about all these things while they make their art, and this is it's very difficult. Certainly difficult. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so it's also partly about uh, cultivating groups of people who have these other skills as well uh, yes. that can and keep us all course, going. Keep I don't, I don't yeah. work much in this country, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I realize that it's not, it shouldn't be just your fight, you know, it should be the fight of, you know, the government should be on your side, the universities, the institutions should all be on your side. Everyone should be making an effort to uh, be able to, uh, to show art, you know, and in all different contexts, everywhere. Uh, and in America, I don't know if that happens at all. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, I, I think about it even, you know, I think about our chancellor who wants, you know, the arts to be sort of integrated and, and into the fabric of student life on the one hand. And then we have you on the other hand saying, I know a whole lot of artists who need a place to go. And it, it seems like there's a chocolate and peanut butter situation. You know, it seems like it should be a little easier. Yeah, but you know, sometimes I feel that if you, if you have no resources at all, you can still make theater. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I learned to make theater here at Berkeley. We have no budget when we're making our, our, our plays. We, we have a costume shop we can pull from, but that's it. And then you have a theater that people, that we're allowed to use. And if you're making art, any space can become an exhibition space. Anywhere can be a theater. You know, to me, I think, I think if we learn that way, that you can work on zero budget and any place can be your, 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 your window, then you have a lot of chances um, to do it. And then the rest is all about spirit, you know, about the people coming together and doing something together. Uh, and that grows, you know, then you can, I think, I think it's, it's a lot about people coming together and working together to make it happen. Another question? There, there, there. Um, I, I want to follow up on, on one subject that um, Stein uh, talked about earlier, the creativity. So you said we are born with creati uh, creativity, but later uh, some of our life habits block, block our cre creativity. I was just wondering if you could give us one example of two, what habits block our creativity and what can we do to unblock? Well, when, once I was on a Shanghai street I saw this uh, woman with her uh, young son, and the son was uh, pointing to the sky and saying, Mom, look at that dog. <laughs> and what I'm saying is very sad because the mother slapped him and said, that's a cloud, that's not a dog. And this is just a very graphic example of how one, I mean, I think for that boy, that was it. You know, he's, I don't think he'd ever think creatively anymore. But we also have all these habits where, uh, where, you know, in a way, in the broadest sense, concepts are what are what are blocking our way. But we have concepts about everything. You know, like what is this? This is a talk by Bruce and Stan and Shannon is moderating. But how do we take away all these concepts? What is this? Is a microphone? You know, or this is an alumni house? Or this is a room? Uh, how can we just take away all the labels of everything that we see? And of course, then you can see how how actually frightening that can be, you know? But as an artist, we have to be able to do that, to take away the labels from, from all the things. And then, and then they're liberated. And then these things can become anything. You know, they can be put together in any way to make any kind of sense that you want them to. But you first have to be able to see how, how things aren't, aren't exactly the way you're taught to see them. You know, life, Life itself is just this continuous flood of distractions. I mean, we all know that, you know, family and jobs and driving and, and getting from here to there. And, and it's, it's pretty much uses us up. And I, I think that, I don't know how, how you learn it, but you, you have to clear yourself from that, either learning it or have it, I don't know where, but you, the, the, the clutter will just, will, will, use every, will use you up completely. Um, sculptors are unusual in the sense of stepping in and out of the right and the left brain. If, if, a, if a sculptor can't get out of the creative mode and he goes to his table saw and can't suddenly be very focused and practical and real, he'll cut his hands off. 
But when he goes back to working on that piece, if he can't step back into the, 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 the conversation that that shape is having with him, if he continues with that, then focus on the, the world out there, then he can't get back into that space. So I don't know how you do that. I think it's worth talking about within and, and with students and with all of that to at least make them aware uh, of it. Because um, the, the default is that there's all this input coming in and it's 100% consuming. And then how do you block pieces of that like a, like a tunnel or some way to to stop all of that input and thought and plans and what am I going to do tomorrow and what did I, you know, what's going on in the, with ISIS and, and my wife's going to have a baby and, you know, all this stuff, it's life. But if all of that's still coming at you, if you can't turn that off, you can't make anything special. Another question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So um, you, you discussed some uh, sculpture and theater of time being a differentiating factor. But if we consider a, a larger parameter of sculpture, of installation, uh, time-based works, food-based works, works made with a, with a more imper impermanent materiality, um, I'm just wondering how, we, how else we might define that difference between theater and installation or theater and sculpture, because I think there can be a lot of overlaps. And I'm also wondering on the second half of that, if there might be some places where you might see uncomfortable mergings um, that are like cross, cross medium mergings that um, start to not work. Well, when I talked about um, myself, I, first of all, I'm, I, I don't do installations, but that doesn't mean that I reject that as a perfectly valid uh, you know, aspect of sculpture. But I do think that there is a danger of putting the superficial parts of different disciplines and trying to think that you're just kind of getting the best of both. Um, because real, real resolution and authority um, that any really successful work of art has to have um, isn't just casually transferable. And I'm not in any way saying that that can't be, but there is a little tendency sometimes to think, well, I'll I'll just take a piece of this and a piece of that, and this new this new mixture will be richer for, for that. Um, and it's difficult to do um, because real mastery, uh, as Stan said, you know, you 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 really have to know what, what you're doing and. Um, you can't take a piece of something else and just kind of put it on. I'm not saying it can't happen. Yeah, and I think there's a basic difference between the viewer of theater and the viewer of sculpture because theater, most theater, takes place in a set, set time, in a set place. But for sculpture, you're there and you create the time you are with the sculpt with the piece. You know, um, we can't quite do that in theater. We have because we're controlling the time frame. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there are pieces that are much more open-ended on that mm -hmm. that way, and, and those pieces then become much more like sculpture. And those, I and to Anne's question, it's partly about so those intermedial experiments. Some are really interesting, and some maybe don't work. <laughs> um, but it, yeah, but there is, I think, something about. Perform, you know, opening up performance so that the audience member controls the time. Scary proposition, yeah. but interesting yeah. if it works. Um, and yeah, thanks, vice versa. Um, okay, I think we yeah. have more questions, Lance, and then we'll get sure. another person here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I want to follow up on this this question of time and actually collaboration. And what you talked about in terms of sculpting the work, we tend to talk. Certainly in the sculpture we're talking about a work that exists over time, it is. And in theater and other performance arts, it's not only not, it's, it's in time, it, it doesn't exist, it exists through time, not in time. But there's also this element, like a Zen garden, you can continue to kind of break it, because you have collaborative artists that you're working with as well. And I, I'm interested in the, prof the creative process from each of your perspectives, 
because you're coming at the work, even though it's very different as it exists over time and in time, in terms of one working in isolation almost from beginning to end, but also a process which I'm assuming, Bruce, it's not just a work that's done, but it's a process that continues in terms of your own raking of a garden, but that's a question, mm -hmm. uh, continuing in a kind of series as you, as you continue to explore the mm -hmm. kind of space mm -hmm. and the kind of, of figures that you're creating. And Stan, for you, in terms of both the isolated part of it, which is when you're creating initially the work, and the process then when you enter into a more public domain of working with other artists and then the feedback that continues through the work, this is you're going to do in, in China. Anyway, that's my question. So that to some degree, you're working on, on the same forms in different series, in different iterations. Yes, and what happens with that is it's um, a piece gives you an idea for another piece. And when that continues to happen, then sometimes we call that a series or a style or whatever. And for myself, as long as one piece leads me to another one, gives me an idea that's sort of like, oh, well, you know, that's, I can still say something, I can say something different with this. In, in a way, I think that what, what, I'm do, what you're doing is, what I feel I'm doing is discovering a new language that first of all, first I'm learning, and it's a language of a certain relationship of shapes. And as long as that language is interesting to me, and I feel that I'm discovering new things I can say in it, then I'm interested in pursuing that still within that language. When I find myself kind of saying, well, you know, what else do I have to say in this? Then I usually start looking for something else. Um, so when, they, when it doesn't lead to another, then I know it's time to move on. Uh, one aspect of the question, you may not be answering your question, but you made me think of the way I work. Sculpt I find sculpturally is that I'm not always, I don't write a play and then rehearse it. I write an outline and then I, working with the actors, I build the play. So when I'm doing that, when I'm building the play in the rehearsal studio, I find that I must let go of myself. So I'm conducting the rehearsal, but I'm not. It's like a meditation. It's like when I let go of myself, then I'm in total contact with the work itself. And I'm sure, Bruce, that's probably what you do when you're sculpting, is that you have, there's something that you have to get into the work. You have to get into the piece. Absolutely. Yeah, and the way to get into the piece, for me, is to, is to let go of it. You know, it's, it's a kind of strange contradiction. But maybe that's what you're talking about when they're raking the Zen garden also. Um, if you rake it with a purpose, it probably doesn't come out too well. And when you throw away the purpose, then some greater purpose seems to appear. Another question? Okay, we have one there, and then we'll get the next one up here. Yeah. Hi. Um, I think yeah, Hi. Um, thank you both for your thoughts and creativity. It's been really inspiring. I have a bit of a selfish question, and it's I'm a composer, and I've been recently interested in more like multimedia, intermedia, collaborative type things. And frankly, when you talk about creativity, as you said, there's there's a skill, there's an affinity that's necessary, and there's a human limit, right, to how many things we can have skills for. Um, and mine is really only for sound, and yet trying to do cross-disciplinary art in academia where everything's supposed to be a solo experience, I find that I'm doing a lot of very mediocre work. Um, what, what recommendations do you have for cross-disciplinary artists, or do you think it really should all be collaborative? Well, well first of all, I don't believe that you can't be good at many things. You can be. You know, you, you can get the skills for all the disciplines you want to work in. It just takes time, and you have to spend that time and master your craft at all, at all of them. And of course, what you're doing is is a, a field in itself, you know, and so um, there's difficulty in that. Uh, sometimes I find young artists tend to like to do something that is, you know, cross borders, cross-cultural, whatever. And in a way, they do that as a means to sort of 
hide their inadequacies. You know, um, I'm not saying you do. I don't know your work. I'm sure you don't. But sometimes it's a convenient way of saying, you know, sort of masking yourself and saying, look at that, look at all these things I'm doing. Uh, but I really believe that um, if you're good at really, really good at one thing, then the other things come too. Bruce, is, I'm sure, is very modest in saying that uh, in music he's just a listener, but. But I bet that uh, Bruce probably understands music more than most people on, on this planet, you know, because he's a sculptor. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it is going back to that earlier, those earlier comments about being inspired by other art forms. Yeah, yeah but there, you know, there, I think that one thing that, that, that artists that achieve things have a lot of focus. And I just think that is a real aspect. And you, you do see young artists that, uh, that are dripping with talent and they just can't focus. And, and you know, you just can't go anywhere without that. I mean, it just, I'm just, it's, the, it's just the truth. The work, the work will never arrive at a point of real excellence if, if you don't have a pretty strong focus because it'll be, it's a scatter gun otherwise, and I don't know, I just, in my experience, that's just the way it is. May I take that one step farther, saying that what, what, I, what I interpret as focus goes back to what I'm saying about motivation. Why are you doing what you do? And may I venture to say that uh, I think for an artist, it's a constant struggle to be doing something selfishly for yourself, or to be doing something totally non-selfishly for others. So can your art, can the, the piece of art that you're making, can it be a total gift to the world with no thought of, of any whatever for yourself, like glory or sales or whatever, uh, reviews or whatever, can you do that? Um, I don't think it's possible to be 100% either way. But I think this is something you can, it's a gauge that you can think about when you're, when you're doing your art. How much is it for yourself and how much is it for others? And for me, I always think, when I ever think this way, I think that the, the more that it's for others, the better it is and the better the work it is. And maybe we can take a last question. Yeah. Thank you. You know, every time you say something, I have another question. <laughs> so, um, Stan, what you just, the last words that you just said, um, I, I'm hearing that even if you experienced rejection during the journey of your life, you still would be doing what you're doing. I'm going to say yes to that. Yes. And I guess Bruce too, because it is, being an artist in any format, from what I've read and what I've learned from writers and musicians and visual artists, it's a total spiritual sacrifice. It's a dedication. And I truly believe that it's going to take, well, you said, you used the word curiosity, and so you have to have curiosity, but you have to have courage, and you have to make choices, and you give up other things that are not important to you, because that passion is your oxygen, and, you know, I mean, I, I need all the arts, I need the music, and, and whatever format it comes in, it inspires in, in such a way that's magical. You know, and I mean, hearing all of your comments touches on different elements of life that um, you might not be a famous artist like the two of you, but the joy that you get from uh, appreciating and being a part of, you know, the journey of creativity is um, endless. And I think at the end, it's the most spiritual uh, gift you're going to get in life, you know, be it religion, be it meditation, it's, I, I don't know how you can live without it. So, I thank you, you know, I thank you for touching on so many things. But in the big picture, uh, there's so few that can um, sacrifice everything without having enough food to eat. So, if you can balance, you got to make, and, you know, you make your choices. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think, uh, <coughs> Sometimes I think, though, that our work is overly romanticized. Uh, you know, um, in, 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 in one way, I do what I do because I, I think I'm good at what I do. 
and, and therefore I'm doing it. And if I wasn't good at what I'm doing, then, you know, I think I would continually be, you know, pushed away from doing it and maybe in the end stop doing it. I don't know. I don't think you don't have a choice. I think you're bored. You know, I, I, I want to emphasize that I think that, you know, I don't feel proud that I've made good sculptures. The, 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 the sculptures are a result of something. And I, it, it would, it's, the, the, the relationship of that discovery is, is, is what I care about. But I don't feel like, wow, I made a pretty good sculpture. Um, it's, the, the, the works, you know, they, they're, they're their own thing. They, they have their own life and their own personality. Um, it's, it's the, it's the path, the, it's the quest of the sculpture that's, that's, that's interesting. And if that itself wasn't worth it, wasn't the payoff, I wouldn't do it because otherwise it's a lousy job. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 so it, it's not, it, and in some ways it sounds very selfish to say that you're spending your life just kind of keeping this, this interest of this, this path, this discovery, this, this exploration. But that's really what it is for me. It's not the end result. It's not how many sculptures there are in the end. It's, did I remain interested doing that? And because when I'm doing that, there is something that happens. It's just the best thing that, that, that happens. But it's, it's, inside, it's inside me what that best thing is. And, and, that, and then it's just by luck if there's something that comes out of that that other people like to see. I tend to think that our, our works become a, a, not, a, a way of humbling ourselves. Uh, to start with, when you're a young artist and your works are seen and people say good things about them, it, it, they're a source of, of vanity. You, get, you feel good, uh, you get praised. But then, I think as you grow older, you really look more carefully at, is your work influencing other people in a good way? And, and if it's not, then you should, be, you should really think, think about what you're doing. So as I say, it humbles you. Uh, and particularly sometimes if your work is very well received, um, I think you should feel even more humility and say, well, you know, I'm, as Bruce just said, there's a huge luck factor in that because we put in everything to what we do and whether or not you like it or not you know it's so flaky you know um, sometimes the work we do I, I, I think this wasn't a very great thing because, wow that was the greatest thing we ever saw and sometimes you, you put all this work in you think this is the greatest thing and people don't quite understand it and you also have to learn that's okay too you know that's okay in the end are we are we good judges of what we do uh, and, and what we do, how does that reflect or benefit the people who see it? I think that's the important thing. Bruce and Stan, thank you for your commitment to these pursuits, for your humility, for your courage, for um, staying curious, and for being with us for a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.